If you've ever seen a human brain, there's probably one single characteristic that jumped out to you immediately. Brains are pretty gross. But if you can get over your disgust and take a slightly longer look, there's another physical characteristic of the brain that's impossible to miss. Human brains, and in fact the brains of nearly all vertebrate animals, are split into a very clear left and right hemisphere. So the brain remains the most poorly understood organ in the human body. But through extensive research, we have been able to identify different portions of the brain and what processes those sections of the brain control. Each hemisphere of the brain does include different functions, and as a result, the belief is propagated through pop psychology that each person has a dominant half of their brain that controls their personality. Analytical and logical people are said to be left brain dominant, while creative and emotional people tend to be right brain dominant. There are a myriad of quick tests that you can take online that will tell you which side of your brain is more dominant and thus what your personality type is. And look, instinctively, this makes a lot of sense to a lot of people, and also because that's what pop science has told you over the years. So, I mean, there are nearly 8 billion different people in the world, so logically they should all possess one of two possible personality types, right? Or maybe there could be a third personality because those tests may also tell you that you use both sides of your brain equally. And look, obviously, when you frame it like that, the whole idea does sound a little bit ridiculous. People have a wide variety of different personalities, and even the nonsensical pseudoscience of the Myers-Briggs test proposed 16 different personality types. So, where exactly did this myth come from? Why did the world get split into left versus right brain personalities? And why has the notion refused to go away? The Origins it began back in the mid-1800s with two doctors, French physician and anatomist Paul Broker and German neurologist Karl Wernicke. Though their research was conducted separately, they both made groundbreaking discoveries in the study of brain function localization. Now, these were sort of dangerous waters to be treading in so shortly after phrenology had been well and truly debunked, but their work, you know, it was based on actual science and experimentation rather than racism. Now, both men were famous for studying patients suffering from aphasia, a condition where damage to the brain affects a person ability to speak or understand written language. Through extensive research of brain damaged patients, and of course some autopsies to confirm that brains were damaged in the way they expected, it was shown that the main language processing center of the brain is in the left hemisphere. It was also shown that spatial recognition was centered in the right hemisphere of the brain. Then, for about 100 years, nothing happens. Or maybe all the scientists were too busy developing nuclear weapons and uh, researching antibiotics or something like that. Look, either way, the next big development in the left versus right right brain saga would come in the 1960s when Nobel Prize winning neurologist Roger Sperry began his research with split brain patients. Sperry's research originally came from one very confusing question. Why was it that when a person learned to solve a problem with one of their eyes, when that eye was covered, they were still able to solve the problem using their other eye? Now that is a really strange question which you might think doesn't need to be answered, but it took Sperry down a rabbit hole that would revolutionize our understanding of the brain. First, he started with Cats. Sperry would sever optical nerves so that the left eye was connected only to the left hemisphere of the brain and the right eye only to the right hemisphere. Then he would cut the corpus callosum, the band of nerve fibers connecting the two sides of the brain. Once this needless animal mutation was completed, he would cover one of the cat's eyes and teach it to differentiate between a triangle and a square. When that eye was then covered and the cats were presented with the shapes again using their other eye, they had no idea what they had just learned. This led Sperry to speculate that the two sides of the brain were functioning completely independently of one another when not connected by the corpus callosum. But it also led to a much more important discovery. Severing the corpus callosum was an effective treatment for people suffering from severe epilepsy. Their seizures would start in one hemisphere of the brain and then travel through the corpus callosum to the other side. With that connection severed, the seizures couldn't jump hemispheres and were unable to manifest. Following these surgeries, the patients immediately noticed something remarkable. Not only had their epilepsy been cured, but they had no changes in personality or functioning to report. This was unexpected, and if the brains were still functioning normally, then why did the corpus callosum even need to exist in the first place? Sperry invited many of these patients back to take place in some experiments to try and determine exactly what was going on. Now, at this point in the video, it's pretty important that we mention some commonly reported facts about your brain's hemispheres that actually aren't myths. 
Your right hemisphere does control the movement of the left side of your body, and your left hemisphere does control the movement of the right side of your body. Similarly, each of your eyes is wired to both sides of your brain, with the right side processing each eye's left field of vision, and vice versa. Now, if you're wondering why our brains uh, wires this kind of backwards way round, scientists haven't actually figured that out yet, so sorry. But there is a theory that states it may have developed in other vertebrates as a survival mechanism. For example, seeing a predator in the left field of vision would be an indication to run to the right. Another theory speculates that over the course of millions of years of vertebrate evolution, some quadrupedal species' heads rotated 90 degrees in one direction, with its body later rotating 90 degrees in the opposite direction, meaning that the head was essentially put on backwards. So, if you ever find yourself wondering if the brain is really as poorly understood as people often state, just remember that maybe our heads are on backwards is a very real scientific theory for why our brains are wired the way they are. But back to Sperry's research. He decided to exploit the way that our eyes are wired to perform some experiments. By having patients stare at the center of the screen, something could be flashed quickly on either the left or the right side of the screen. It would happen too quickly for the patients to move their eyes, so it would only ever be seen in either their left or right field of vision, and the signal would only be sent to one side of the brain. When a word was flashed onto the right side of the screen, it was thus processed by the left brain. These patients would repeat the word, but when it was flashed on the opposite side, the patients couldn't remember seeing a word at all. This led Sperry to believe that all language processing was done on the left side of the brain, but he wanted to be sure, like the good scientist that he was. He repeated the experiment, but this time the patient's left hand was placed in a bowl of objects under a partition that they couldn't see through. A word was flashed onto the left side of the screen to be seen by the right side of the brain. The right brain would then instruct the left hand to pick up that object, but when the patient was asked why they were holding the item, they had no idea. Now, these results were weird and absolutely remarkable. The right brain had recognized the word and made the left hand pick that object up. But because the right side of the brain can't formulate language and the left side of the brain had been blind to the entire process, the patients had no way to articulate what had just happened or why. In a similar experiment, the patients were instead asked to draw what they saw with their left hand instead of picking it out of a bowl. However, in this experiment, a different word would flash on each side of the screen. The patients would draw the word seen by their right brain, but when asked what they drew, they would describe the word seen by their left brain. By severing the corpus callosum, the two hemispheres of the brain not only could no longer communicate, but they seemed to be completely unaware of the existence of one another. Sperry's award-winning research showed that different tasks were handled by different parts of the brain. Speech, writing, language, and calculation were handled in the left hemisphere, while spatial perception, non-verbal concept formation, attention, and some amount of word recognition were handled on the right. However, his research was solely about how the brain works and said absolutely nothing about personality or other people having one side of the brain that was more dominant than the other. He even noted that for some people, particularly lefties, the role of the two hemispheres were reversed. But most importantly, he said it was important not to oversimplify this highly detailed and analytic research. What did I just tell you? So, on September the 9th, 1973, the New York Times Magazine decided to oversimplify this highly detailed and analytic research with an article titled, We Are Left-Brained or Right-Brained. The idea that the left brain focused on language and the right brain focused on spatial reasoning was simplified to the left brain being logical and the right brain being creative. The article in question even described the left brain as verbal, analytical, dominant, and the right brain as artistic but mute. Shortly after that article, another one appeared in Time Magazine, and well, then it was off to the races with the pop side. The myth of left brain versus right brain spread throughout society, where it is still believed by many people to this day. So how did this happen? Why was the myth able to persist for so long? Well, part of it is society's desire to portray creativity and analysis as being the polar opposites of one another, despite the fact that it is patently untrue. If you're good at math but can't draw worth a damn, there's some amount of comfort in being able to say that it's not your fault, it's just the way that your brain is wired. There's also the problem that, like so many other things, the concept began being taught in schools. Brain lateralization, the tendency for each side of the brain to handle different processes, is a very real thing that was based in actual scientific research. But understanding science can be difficult, and as a result, children's textbooks are often filled with the results of oversimplified or misunderstood data. Even today, people are being taught in school that the tongue is separated into regions for each of the different tastes, despite this being an absolutely 
gross misrepresentation of the original research. Finally, there was the one fact that influences so many aspects of our lives, and that's money. The whole left brain versus right brain thing was picked up not only by pop psychology, but also by self-help books and therapists. Suddenly, there was an entire industry based on categorizing people into these two groups and trying to cater to their allegedly different needs. Once there's money to be made, it's hard for something as trivial as actual science to stand in the way of business. Debunking the myth Debunking this argument shouldn't be very difficult to do. After all, even though the myth persisted for decades, there was absolutely no science to support it. That put it on pretty shaky ground to begin with, but in 2013, a research out of the University of Utah wanted to end the debate once and for all. They conducted a study involving over a thousand participants with ages ranging from 7 to 29. Each participant was placed into an fMRI machine which measures changes in blood flow to measure brain activity. One by one, all 1,000 people were placed into the fMRI machine while in a resting state. Basically meaning that they hadn't been given any specific instructions. Since they weren't engaging in any specific task that would necessitate activity in a specific part of the brain that could skew the results, one might predict that people showed more activity in either the left brain or the right brain. At least, one might predict that if they believed the myth. In reality, whether the person was an electrician, a painter, or an elementary school student, their brains all showed similar levels of activity on both sides. No test subject showed dominance from either side of their brain, and they certainly weren't split into two groups, each favoring one side over the other. While it was nice to have some concrete evidence that the whole left versus right brain thing was a myth, it should have been pretty obvious, just given, you know, a little bit of critical thinking. Why would our brains be designed to overload one half while leaving the other half to do essentially nothing? There is evidence that evolution favors brain lateralization as a means of multitasking, for example, using one side of the brain to search for food while the other side remains alert to one's surroundings for predators. We can see evolution trying to optimize for efficient use of the brain, and the idea the idea that our brains would develop with left or right dominance would be in direct defiance of that optimization. It's also worth mentioning that even tasks we often view as being either logical or creative often have a lot of overlap. And also that people can be good at both. Pythagoras of Triangle fame was also one of the earliest musical theorists. Famed painter Leonardo da Vinci was a polymath and an inventor. Now you could argue that their talents in seemingly opposite endeavors were an exception, but even looking at specific tasks, we see the overlap of logic and creativity. While the end result on a painter's canvas may be the result of creative expression, it wasn't achieved without logic or analysis. They had to know what paints to mix and what proportions to make desired colors, and they had to determine what brush or tool was best for producing the desired effect. And on the other side of the spectrum, maths has frequently been referred to as a young man's game, and Albert Einstein even said, a person who has not made his great contribution to science before the age of 30 will never do so. Obviously, neither Einstein nor the world's mathematicians were claiming that everyone suddenly becomes stupid when they're 30. Their point was that as people get older, they get more set in their ways. Innovation in maths and science isn't driven by the people who can perform arithmetic in their heads the fastest, it's driven by creativity. Now, the idea that people lose their creativity as they get older is starting to fall out of favor, but the point is that whether it's art, science, or anything in between, you are using both hemispheres of your brain working in concert to achieve your goals. Unless your job happens to be something monotonous like data entry, in which case you're probably not using either side of your brain, are you? Thanks for watching. Thank you.